So I just described how we can go from anatomical to functional targeting, where with anatomical targeting, we're always going to be limited uh, in our ability to deliver current to one group of cells by not stimulating the others. Well, with functional targeting, we assume that these cells, the ones we want to stimulate, have somehow become active due to, for example, practicing something, getting rehabilitation, thinking something. And so we've activated a network in the brain, and now that et network becomes susceptible to stimulation. The cells that are not active don't get affected by stimulation, and the, effects, the cells that are active do get affected by stimulation. But how would TDCS do that? How would TDCS affect just the green ones and not the gray ones? So we need to think, to answer that question, we need to think a little bit about the basic cellular mechanisms of TDCS. And I need to compare super and sub-threshold stimulation. Now with super-threshold stimulation, this is high-intensity stimulation, shocks are delivered to the brain, and those shocks cause cells to fire. If you deliver two shocks, the cells fire twice. If you stimulate at 100 hertz, the cells fire at 100 hertz. And so you are with high intensity stimulation, super threshold stimulation, you are always overdriving neurons. You're making things fire more. And whatever happens to the brain that might be beneficial as a result of that, if you're using this as a therapy, is secondary to making cells fire more. Most electroceuticals, most brain stimulation techniques are super threshold. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is super threshold. It can make our finger twitch. Uh, invasive techniques, DBS, cortical stimulation are super threshold as well. Um, now, in contrast to that, low intensity direct current stimulation is sub threshold. What that means is that, is that if these cells are not firing, and we apply a low intensity direct current, they still don't fire. The low intensity stimulation is not enough to make them fire. But in the brain, and this is critical, the cells are never, the, your neurons are never inactive. They're, they're, they're constantly active, whether you're thinking about something, whether you're um, not thinking about something and you're, and you're sleeping, uh, the neurons in your brain are constantly active and in very specific states. In this sense, if we apply direct current stimulation, we might change the firing behavior of existing cells. So direct current stimulation is not assumed to produce any firing. It's actually produced to produce a change in firing. And so it produces a weak polarization of neurons and the neuromodulation that's produced by TDCS has to do with how it interacts with ongoing activity. So something is ongoing, like you're thinking about something, you're practicing something, and TDCS is placed on top of that and changes the neuronal activity associated with that task. And so it is inherently specific to the ongoing activity. And so this is TDCS as well as other techniques uh, that are sub-threshold, such as TACS and TRNS. And to get still more granular, I want you to think about the organization of the, of the human cortex. This is a um, um, classic um, uh, stain uh, of the cortex um, by a disciple of, of Cajal. Uh, anybody who does brain research recognizes this as, as um, this sort of striated cortical structure. Uh, and we can think of um, columns as these um, uh, single strided processing units. They're often made of, um, they, are, they are made, uh, they include um, excitatory pyramidal neurons. Um, we could think of these as sort of the central processing units uh, of these cortical columns. Um, they receive input from other brain regions, from other cortical inputs. So that is the input that is arriving at them. They process this input, and then they decide whether or not they're going to fire. And so they send... Uh, information to other parts of the brain. So uh, I want you very simplistically to think of um, the brain as being made out of cortical columns and these cortical columns receive input from other brain regions or from the environment. They process that information and they make a decision whether or not they're going to fire or not. And so we can think of TDCS as direct current stimulation of columns because we're passing current through the brain, through the cortex, and as a result we're passing current through these columns as they process information.
And so when we want to ask, how does direct current stimulation change information processing? How might it be functionally targeted? Um, we can think about it in terms of direct current stimulation and these cortical columns. And we can ask, therefore, very specific questions in this sense. Now, I'm going to be showing you data from animal models, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but these are very well established um, systems to investigate neurophysiology and plasticity. Um, and there are many advantages uh, to using a, a brain slice, either from a, cor a cortex or from hippocampus. Uh, there are many types of experiments that you could do that would be impossible in a person or even in an intact animal. Uh, and so this is a system that we've been using now for almost 20 years to look at the effects of direct current stimulation, and we've collected a lot of data. We specifically asked the question, what does direct current stimulation do to the pyramidal neuron? So this seems like a very important neuron. It's both receiving input, it's processing that input, and then it's making a decision about what to do with it. And we can now think of different forms of direct current stimulation. First of all, the current can flow in different directions. It can flow, in this case, from the top of the screen down or from the bottom of the screen and up. We call this a nodal stimulation in this direction, and in this direction we call it cathodal stimulation. This really corresponds to a nodal TDCS, and this corresponds to cathodal TDCS. So in this case, the positive electrode, the anode, would be on the top of the head here, and in this case, the cathode would be on the top of the head here. We can also consider current flowing sideways, so along the cell type. And so I'm going to call this current perpendicular to the primary axis uh, of these cells. And the question is, how does current flow in these different directions affect the cell? Either a nodal flowing down in this direction, cathodal flowing up, or sideways. And we were building on work going back decades that had very specific hypotheses about what you'd expect. Current flowing down into the head, the anodal direction, is expected to produce a polarization profile that looks like this. The soma would be depolarized and the dendrite would be hyperpolarized. Current flowing in the opposite direction would produce the opposite type of polarization profile the soma would be hyperpolarized, and the dendrite would be depolarized. Now, in either case, I want to emphasize, you always have both depolarization and hyperpolarization. There's no such thing as any form of electrical stimulation, uh, low-intensity electrical stimulation, um, that produces just depolarization or just hyperpolarization. You always get this seesaw kind of pattern. And the reason is that current flowing in this direction, for example, will cross into the cell, producing hyperpolarization, will need to flow down the cell, and then exit it, producing depolarization. So because current always has to enter and exit, you get a seesaw, the sort of seesaw polarization profile. And the direction of the current flow determines which end is depolarized and which end is hyperpolarized. So in the anodal direction, the soma is depolarized. In the cathodal direction, the soma is hyperpolarized. And it turns out that when current is flowing sideways, because it's not flowing along the cell axis, there was an assumption that it wouldn't produce any polarization. So this is a theory of something that we tested directly. This is an example of optical imaging with voltage-sensitive dyes conducted in a hippocampal slice. Um, this is a dye that stains the cell membrane and it fluoresces, it glows with an intensity that's actually related to the membrane potential. And we applied direct current stimulation to brain slices stained with voltage-sensitive dye. So here's the baseline period, and during this block of time here, the direct current stimulation is on, and then it's turned off. And what you can quickly see is that you get this biphasic polarization profile, where it's hyperpolarized in one end and depolarized in the other. Now this is the cathodal uh, variation. The cells here are inverted from the previous picture, but along this way is what we call cathodal. So we see the seesaw pattern. And you also see that when we turn on the direct current stimulation, the cells polarize and they stay polarized until we turn it off. Now how much is this seesaw type of polarization? We can ask that question using intracellular recording. So these are examples of cells that are morphologically reconstructed. 
and you re we recorded from their soma during the application of direct current stimulation. And we asked the question in the soma, how much polarization do you see during TDCS? And the answer is, as expected, not much. The most sensitive cells here, these very large uh, pyramidal cells, their soma polarizes 0.3 millivolt for vo 1 volt per meter of direct current stimulation. Uh, this is how we quantify the intensity of stimulation that these cells are exposed to. Other types of cells, cells that were not as large, polarized even less, only 0.1 millivolt uh, for the same amount of field. And some cells, their somas didn't polarize at all when we applied stimulation. And it, <coughs> and it turned out we could explain this very much by the morphology of the cells. So in the case of these pyramidal cells, the reason the soma was being polarized was because it wasn't in the middle. We've got this seesaw polarization profile. And the farther uh, the soma was away from the middle, the more it would polarize. And we also found that cell size mattered as well. Well, with other cells like interneurons, because the soma is in the middle, it's not polarized. Now, the dendrites are still polarized, so it's not that the current is not having an effect, but the soma itself is not being polarized. So what does this mean as far as TDCS? Well, in TDCS, we apply a milliamp of current. At the brain, that produces about 0.3 volts per meter. So that is the intensity that the cells in the brain are being exposed to. Um, and um, we know that this current flow will produce cell polarization when it flows along the um, direction of the cells. We know that the anodal version will produce soma depolarization, where this cathodal will produce the soma hyperpolarization. And we know that the most sensitive cells will polarize about 0.3 millivolt per volt per meter of electricity that they've been exposed to. Now, if we combine this sensitivity with the amount of electricity that they're actually being exposed to, we get a value. And that value is that during TDCS, the most sensitive neuron in the most sensitive part of the brain will polarize just a little bit, about less than 0.1 millivolt. Now this isn't very much, and it's certainly not enough to make a cell fire. So if a cell is at minus uh, 80, uh, let's say to reach action potential threshold, it needs to get to minus 60. So that's a 20 millivolt polarization. That's what, for example, deep brain stimulation produces, or TMS, but not TDCS. TDCS will only produce about 0.1 millivolt of polarization. TDCS does not produce firing. But even a very small amount of polarization can change ongoing firing. It can change the ongoing activity of the cell. Um, and so we can think of direct current stimulation as polarizing cells in the brain in this case, I'm showing you the anodal form of stimulation. And what are these cells normally doing? They're receiving information from different parts of the brain, and they're making then a decision about whether or not they should fire. And so when we apply direct current stimulation and we polarize these cells, we can now ask the question, for the same input, the same input that was arriving before, now in the presence of TDCS, Will these cells process this information differently? Will the same information arriving at the brain now produce a different response? This is also something that we've addressed in animal models based on very specific theories. Um, here now we have a cell, a cartoon of a cell in the, in the brain, and it's receiving an input. And this is in the absence of direct current stimulation. Here we have a nodal stimulation, cathodal stimulation, and no stimulation at all. And the question is, for an input arriving to this brain region, how will a nodal stimulation, which depolarizes the soma, change the processing of that input? How will cathodal stimulation change the processing of that same input? And also, how will sideways stimulation affect that input as well? Um, and we can... Because we are working in a brain slice, uh, we have a lot of sensitivity over which cells and which pathways we record from. We can also ask the question, if an input arrives at the cell soma versus an input that arrives at the cell dendrite, how might they be processed differently?
And this is an interesting question because this side of the cell, in this case, a nodal is being depolarized, and this side of the cell is being hyperpolarized. So what does that mean as far as inputs arriving in the soma versus inputs arriving in the dendrite? Um, so we can have pathway-specific testing. Um, there is a very well-established marker for this in the brain slice. It's called the excitatory postsynaptic potential. So when input comes down to the cell, neurotransmitter is released. And when it's picked up by this postsynaptic cell, it generates what's called an excitatory postsynaptic potential. What this signal is here, which we record outside the cell as a measure of, is the strength of this connection. It's how much this cell responds to a given input. In animal models, when we apply direct current stimulation during the arrival of this input, what we can show is that nodal stimulation makes this input more effective, while cathodal stimulation makes the input less effective. We're not changing how much firing is being produced here on the input side in this case. And, in, and actually, in this case, the input is not even strong enough to make the cells fire. But what we're doing is we're changing the strength of the connectivity between the cells. And we actually found probing different pathways that the change that you see seems to be always related to the depolarization of the soma. So the soma seems the most important. So in this case, with the soma depolarized, both this input and this input are being enhanced. So going back to this cartoon, what we found was that in situations where you have a nodal stimulation, Inputs, whether they're coming to the soma or to the dendrite, are enhanced. While in situations where you have cathodal stimulation, current going in the opposite direction, and the soma is hyperpolarized, inputs arriving to both brain regions are inhibited. And then what's interesting is we found that when current is being applied in this direction, this sort of sideways direction, that does not produce any somatic polarization, we could actually still change the strength of the connectivity. Now, why was that? Well, if we think about direct current stimulation flowing in this direction, while it doesn't actually affect the cells, the axons themselves are oriented in a way that would make them sensitive. And so what we're able to discover through a series of, of detailed neurophysiological tests is that sideways current, while not stimulating the pyramidal cells, can change how the cortical column processes input. And it turned out also that when you apply direct current stimulation uh, in the regular direction, in this case the nodal direction, you don't just polarize the cells themselves, you polarize the terminals as well. So even in this direction, we discovered that how much change you see in how the cortical column processes information isn't just related to pyramidal cell polarization but to terminal polarization as well. And we studied this in exhaustive detail. I can refer you to this paper as well. And, and it, it's certainly not trivial how direct current stimulation changes information processing in, in the cortical column, but it's explainable and it is inevitable. So when you apply direct current stimulation in a direction that is, is, is parallel to the cortical column, you change synaptic efficacy in a way that's very consistent with how you polarize the soma. But regardless of which way the current is flowing, you're going to change information processing because current flowing in the sideways direction will polarize the inputs themselves. Uh, we've actually found that with modeling, the most of the current um, is sideways, not going inward. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's fortuitous that the sideways is still um, effective. Uh, and we also found out that the terminals are much more sensitive than the somas as well. And so while people tend to traditionally focus on this direction, we believe that this direction is, is also very important. And we've quantified the sensitivity of, of synaptic strengths to direct current stimulation. And what we found was you get about a 1% change in synaptic efficacy uh, um, per voltmeter of direct current stimulation. So during TDCS, you're talking about uh, about a third of a percent of change in synaptic efficacy. Now you may say, well, that doesn't seem like very much. Well, maybe not, but then again, maybe it is. I'm, I'm, who's to say that when your brain is, is trying to learn something or when your brain is being treated, a small change uh, in efficacy uh, cannot produce a, a, a big change in outcome.